let's not waste any more time. Let's maybe begin. Um, I'll, I'll go. I'll sort of go around on the screen as I as I see all my colleagues. But I'll probably start with Simon, just because I think one of the key the sort of the headlines, if you like, from COP twenty eight was this outcome around fossil fuels, and it was contained, which I think was a historic first. Right, we the, no COP agreement in history has mentioned that the actual term fossil fuels. Um, but it was contained within something called the global stock take. So maybe, Simon, if you want to just um, take a, a minute or so just to explain what that was and, and why you think that that was a kind of key takeaway from COP28. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Leo. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, and just before I begin, I'd, I'd just really like to pay tribute to all my colleagues for their amazing work over the last couple of weeks. It's been absolutely uh, hectic, um, exhausting and, and, and all that, but um, yeah, really proud of the work that we've done. Um, so yeah, just, just on the, the stock take, so just as a recap, the Paris Agreement obviously signed in, in 2015. At the, whole, the, the, kind of, the whole structure of it is that countries put, put in their own pledges. Everyone voluntarily offers what they're going to do to, to help tackle climate change and help meet collective goals. And the architects of the deal knew at the time that no, you know, that that wouldn't add up to enough. And so that the point of the stock take is to kind of reflect on how far we've come and what more needs to be done if we're to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, stay below 1.5 degrees and so on. And this is the first global stock take. So that's why, you know, many people saw this COP in particular as, as the most important since COP21 in Paris. Um, yeah, so then on, on the fossil fuels deal, um, we obviously had a first in Glasgow where they mentioned coal for the first time and then lots of people wanted, you know, many countries, more than 80 countries last year at COP27 wanted a reference to tackling fossil fuels, but that, that didn't happen. Um, and then it was obviously a huge focus this year on that, particularly given that it was hosted by um, a major fossil fuel producer. And so, um, yeah, the final outcome of the stock take calls on all parties to contribute towards global efforts in a number of areas, one of which is transitioning away from fossil fuels. Now, that's obviously not as strong as the sort of phase out language that many people said was was needed to, to, to stay below 1.5 degrees. But on the other hand, it is, it is like a clear call to action, although calls on is sort of the weakest of all of the calls to action that, that they could have used in the kind of UN legal jargon. It's, it's nevertheless a direct call to action to all countries um, to contribute to that. And crucially, there was a, an earlier draft that had said um, basically calls on parties to take action that could include, as I say, making it entirely optional to, to contribute in that way. So, yeah, it's it's certainly not as strong as many people hoped, but it, it is nevertheless historic. And I'll pause there just to, to avoid going on forever. Uh, great. Great. Thanks, Simon. Um... Daisy, can I ask you to sort of, sort of set the scene about the presidency? Because they're obviously holding the COP in Dubai, in UAE, you know, kind of, um, you know, petro state, as many people would see it. Um, can you just set the scene of the context of that, and particularly around who was actually being, you know, presiding over the talks? Because that was kind of extraordinary. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, my name's Daisy. I'm special correspondent at Carbon Brief, and I was just at... COP28 for the duration. So I only got home yesterday. Yeah, so COP was hosted by UAE, um, in particular by a man called Sultan Al Jabba, who is the head of ADNOT at the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. And of course, his appointment caused a lot of controversy even before COP started. There were many people calling for him to be removed from the post. Um, and, you know, there are people calling his post ridiculous and saying that it highlights problems with the COP process. And what we saw when COP actually started is that Al Jabba made some very like big kind of strides in his first few days. He managed to oversee the loss and damage fund being agreed on the first day of COP, which he said was a historic achievement. Um, he also managed to avoid an agenda fight, which often like takes up a lot of time at the beginning of COPs. So he was sort of making strides in that way. And he did also release a statement, the UEA alongside the, ER, the IEA calling for um, countries to commit to a phase down in this critical decade, which showed, you know, against maybe some expectations that he he was willing to include fossil fuels in the COP process. Um, and as we see at the end, we did get a mention of fossil fuels 
in the global stock take, although not as ambitious as some parties would have liked. Um, but of course, his presidency was massively overshadowed by a series of investigations and reporting that came out both before COP and during. So before COP, um, a story by BBC News and the Centre for Climate Reporting alleged that he planned to use the summit to make secret oil and gas deals on the side. And I think that really cast a large, a large shadow over what he was um, trying to do at the summit. He kept getting questions from journalists on that throughout the summit, and he wasn't really able to move on from it. And halfway through, The Guardian reported on comments he made questioning whether science really calls for a phase out of fossil fuels in order to keep to 1.5. And after that story broke, um, again, it really overshadowed the things that he was trying to do with his presidency. He had to hold a, co a press conference where he directly addressed the comments and he had to defend his own thoughts about science. Um, so it was, yeah, it was very extraordinary. I don't think, as someone that's covered quite a few climate and biodiversity cops, I've never seen the presidency under so much scrutiny and I've never seen so many allegations of conflict of interest and that kind of thing. And in the end, we did end up with an oil executive overseeing fossil fuels being fossil fuel transition being mentioned in a in a cop text for the first time so yeah make of that what you will i'm very happy to answer more questions about it later okay M many thanks daisy um it kind of takes us on really it kind of if we look forward a year cop 29 has been agreed to be in azerbaijan and then i think the year after that in brazil right um and it, it's interesting what cop it's already feeling that COP29 is going to be a finance COP. Um, and and Josh um, Gabatis, who's our policy correspondent, you were following and, and tracking the finance issue quite a lot um, and focused on that within our kind of COP summary. Do you want to give us a sense of how finance, which at every COP is always a huge, huge issue, just how it played out at COP28 and also sort of that looking forward to COP29, which has been billed as a sort of big finance COP? Yeah, hi. Um, so yeah, I was I was covering uh, at the COP. I was covering finance, uh, loss and damage, and adaptation, and all of those issues are very much interlinked in the sense that uh, adapting to climate change, which is, and uh, dealing with the loss and damage caused by climate change, both require large amounts of money, um, as does all the other issues that we're talking about: phasing out fossil fuels, increasing the the scale up of renewables. Um, so finance is essential to everything and all the climate plans that have been submitted by developing countries um, are dependent on a degree of climate finance um, coming from developed countries. That's kind of a crucial part of the whole the whole system. Um, the problem is that uh, the kind of key climate finance pledge that we've had so far in the UN process, the 100 billion by 2020, um, was not met by 2020. Um, and there are just wider concerns, essentially, that the kind of scale up of finance that's required to hit all our pledges is, um, is, is sort of nowhere near being achieved. So that's kind of running through the entire, like every COP, as, as Leo said, but it was... Uh, very prominent at this one and even though climate finance there are lots of different negotiating tracks that focus on climate finance but and none of them were kind of headline slots at this COP but they raised a lot of issues that are bound to uh, feature prominently next year things like expanding the list of countries that are obliged to provide climate finance so it's not just the historically wealthy global north countries like Europe and, and, and the US, um, but also perhaps large emerging economies such as China and Saudi Arabia, um, various other issues such as finding new ways of uh, mobilizing finance through, for example, levies on high emitting sectors and things like that. These are all things that are coming up in the negotiation uh, halls and uh, we should look should be looking out for in, in, the, in the coming year. Mm -hmm. Um, finance was really important to the discussions about adaptation. There was a thing called the Global Goal on, on Adaptation, which um, this year countries were trying to decide on a, a framework for kind of getting that going. It was decided that was the Global Goal on Adaptation was part of the Paris Agreement back in uh, 2015, but it hasn't really gone anywhere since then. And we, we've got this framework now that's arisen from this COP, um, which 
throughout the negotiations, developing countries were saying, we don't want this framework unless there is a commitment to more finance from developed countries. And they didn't really get that. Essentially, the, that was a kind of demand that was running through and really held up negotiations. But um, the final text doesn't really contain that. Um, I suppose the kind of big outcome in terms of finance is the, as Daisy mentioned, the loss and damage fund, which was gaveled through on the first day. Um, that is, and, and, and we saw some pledges starting to come in from uh, wealthy countries, including the, the host, the UAE. Um, there's still a, a lot of issues around that, even though it was agreed on the first day, um, it's still quite contentious. Uh, the fact that it's being hosted in the World Bank is still something which developing countries are not very happy about. Um, all these issues are likely to just keep running and running. Um, I'll leave it there. But as, as Leo said, this is finance is very much the thing to watch next year. Thank you, um, Josh. Um... Talking of um, at the begin right at the beginning, we have these kind of dynamics now with COPs where you have these kind of leaders day where all the world leaders or some of them anyway, kind of come in at the beginning and they make big announcements, speeches, then leave. And then it kind of it sort of gets down to the nuts and bolts and negotiations. Um, Molly, there was a particular um, announcement um, and pledge that around renewables that caught a lot of people's eyes. And it'd been, we'd heard sort of iterations of it or sort of talk of it earlier in the year from uh, you know various other kind of international fora and meetings around the sort of the tripling of renewables by 2020. Do you want to just talk a little bit about um, that in particular and why that, that could be a significant outcome of COP28? Yeah, um, so it happened very early on in the summit and 118 countries led by the EU together with the UAE and the US um, agreed to triple renewables um, along with w doubling energy efficiency as well, which is a bit that I think sometimes gets a bit forgotten under the glamour of uh, the overarching renewables. Um, that was very significant, partially because it's in line with what the IEA has already been calling for. And additional countries continue to sign up um, as the summit continued. So by the 11th, we had over 130 countries had signed up to it, um, which is very significant in terms of this transition away from fossil fuels. Um, it's got to go hand in hand with not just increasing fossil fuel, increasing renewables, but also rolling back and transitioning away from fossil fuels. But um, having that renewables commitment is a good step in the sort of right direction. Uh, the other bits that I was looking at while at COP was the mitigation work program, which kind of goes hand in hand with that move um, towards renewables uh, to a large extent. But after it being such a contentious issue at Bonn in the summer, it actually um, was very procedural and very um, quiet at COP this year. Um, there was four days where we didn't have a single new draft text on it. And the outcome at the end um, didn't really include any headline political calls or statements. Um, most of it was this sort of incremental shift towards having um, a program under which mitigation can sit going forward. So there was an agreement that um, the program will stay until 2030 and that there will be two global dialogues on it every single year. And there's now a kind of question around whether or not some of the comments around fossil fuels that we saw in the GFT will now start to sit under the mitigation work program. Um, the other area I covered was the Just Transition work program, um, which was slightly more contentious. Uh, just Transition came up through the labor movement as the notion that um, people should be protected as we transition away from fossil fuels. Um, that means sort of supporting them in finding new jobs. We know that 80 million jobs globally are probably going to be lost um, as part of the transition away from fossil fuels, but 100 million are likely to be created. So it's about making sure that those things line up and there are job opportunities and communities that get abandoned. One of the biggest issues around this was kind of whether or not it's purely a labor movement or whether or not it goes beyond that and it's a more multilateral approach to things. And that, question kind of meant that that work program ended up being a bit of a microcosm of lots of the other questions that we see at COP. Is it, is it something that is developed global North countries focus or is it something that is actually much more broadly applicable? And um, that comes back to questions around finance, but it also comes back to questions around more broad support. Um, yeah, so those were the kind of key takeaways from the areas that I covered. 
Okay, thanks a lot, Molly. There's always many eyes every year at all the COP at the, at the key negotiating blocks, the key countries. Um, you know, in, within the Carbon Brief team, we obviously had Annika, who was following China very, very closely, and Aruna was on top of what India was doing. And there's obviously other big players like the US, the EU, and things. Um, maybe if we can start with you, Annika, I'd get, like to get a, an insight into how the Chinese delegation approached this COP. What were their priorities? How did they play things? What were they doing at their pavilion in terms of side events? Just give us give, give us a quick sense of how China approached these talks. Absolutely. Um, I was lucky enough to talk to someone who's been going to COP since Copenhagen. And their big takeaway was that China was frankly every year working on a bigger and bigger scale than the year before. And in their view, looking at try, when you're trying to understand what China's priorities are, what, what they're trying to get out of the COP negotiations, it's just as useful to look at what's happening at the pavilion as what's happening in, in their various documents, submissions and, and statements that they're making. So I think going into COP, we were really looking at maybe three or four key areas. We had a sense of where they might land on fossil fuels and, and phase out versus phase down because of longstanding Chinese po um, policies on energy security and, and their kind of increasing carbon emissions um, being balanced at the same time with this massive increase in renewables. We then had in November the Sunnyland Statement, which was a joint statement between the US and China that gave a little bit more of an indication of where the kind of G2 countries would stand on, on some, not all of the key topics at COP. So, and I think crucially in that statement, you had language around tripling energy, uh, sorry, tripling renewable energy with, um, which would then lead to a structural decline in fossil fuels, which we then saw um, taken up in a slightly different format in the global stock take. Beyond that though, we also had, um, some interesting movements on non-carbon emission related topics. So you had methane um, being a key focus of the COP, which I know some of my colleagues will, were also looking at at a slightly more macro scale. And so with methane, you had this huge two hour late um, summit happening that was co-hosted between the US, China and UAE, where from China's perspective, there wasn't really anything new that was that was announced in terms of substance, but from a signaling point of view, particularly back to domestic audiences, um, I think it was a really point, uh, really important moment just to signal how much emphasis the central Chinese government wanted to place on methane and how important, crucially, it was to cooperate with the US on that matter. Um, one other thing to note is that my colleague Josh was talking about how contentious the loss and damage fund was. I think there are a lot of questions going into the COP about whether or not China could be pushed to contribute, as we saw it was not. Um, and it's not it's not a complete surprise that they didn't contribute to the fund this year. There's a lot of big macro questions about, you know, how you classify China. Is it developed? Is it developing? What does that mean, not only for its climate contributions, but broader broader political and geopolitical questions. Um, so I think the consensus was that it's not a huge surprise that China didn't contribute to loss and damage this year, but there could be some sort of movement next year. And an important thing to note that um, some recent carbon brief analysis or guest post analysis showed is that whilst China isn't contributing through loss and damage, it is contributing to adaptation finance through other mechanisms and other platforms. And then just finally, before I uh, before I before I hand over to Aruna, um, the big other question is how China positions itself at bo both at the pavilions, but also in terms of how how it kind of portrays itself as a as a power in in climate negotiations. So you had a huge pavilion, much larger than last year, and certainly much larger than at Glasgow when when things were. Um, constrained by COVID um, and a jam-packed schedule that covered everything from methane abatement in oil and gas to feminism in, in the climate movement to uh, to UK-China cooperation on, on climate science and, and other big questions that I think was really there to portray China not only as 
you know, a, a consequential power in the negotiation rooms, but also a, a, a consequential platform to discuss these topics and an alternative to maybe Western dialogues um, on these issues. At the same time, you then have China in the negotiation room trying to push, um, push back against what it sees as unilateral trade measures taken in the US with the IRA, taken in the EU with CBAM. So for me, it's quite interesting just to see, you know, it portraying itself as, as this maybe open platform at, in the pavilions and then pushing back against the IRA, against CBAM and other mechanisms behind closed doors. OK, thanks, um, Annika. Um, just just before we go quickly to Aruna, I just want to say that there's fantastic questions coming in in the Q&A box. I mean, my colleagues are just trying to sort of grab them and kind of work out if they can, which ones they can take on. We're not obviously going to be able to get to all of them. But just to say we will be publishing this recording hopefully early next week. And we may possibly get a chance if we can. I know everyone needs some rest after COP28. We may try and pick out some as well and maybe and, and answer those um, within that article as well, possibly. Um, so Aruna, yeah, so you obviously were tracking a lots of different thematics and things, but obviously you had a, also had a particular insight into how the Indian delegation approached this. And we've heard from Molly about the, the tripling of renewables and and loss and damage from Josh and so many, so many issues, which India really is a kind of central sort of voice and player within. Do you want to just give us a quick sense of of how India approached the talks, but also sort of pan out met perhaps to some of the other issues you were tracking. Thanks so much, Leo. Hi, everyone. I'm Aruna Chandrasekhar. I cover food, land and nature um, at Carbon Brief, but I'm also deeply invested in all of the fights and as many fights that I can check um, at COP28. And um, I was, of course, uh, paying attention to see um, especially this particular pledge, which was interesting because um, essentially the renewables pledge was an achievement of India. This was what the G20, which is a really huge platform for uh, Prime Minister Modi, talk about India's achievements and being able to uh, gather consensus on this particular target, both on um, tripling renewable energy as well as doubling energy efficiency improvements and that was very much in the uh, the summit's uh, declaration so we thought that um, India would take more credit for that but um, it's not on the pledge because um, yeah and the preamble of the pledge does have some language um, especially that is looking at um, renewables must be accompanied in this decade by a rapid increase but also with the phase down of unabated coal power and in particular, ending continued investment in unabated new coal-fired power plants. So that perhaps could have been one of the reasons why um, India hadn't signed on to the pledge. Um, but particularly notable uh, was also how India played its um, its cards at COP28. Now, uh, the UAE had, of course, um, extended an invitation and Prime Minister Modi spoke at the opening ceremony. Um, he also spoke at a couple of other events you know, on green credits and on a session on climate finance um, and also made a bid for India to play host of uh, at COP33. Now, um, how that proceeds, whether that proceeds, where will it be? Um, a lot of those questions are, of course, there's a long process to deciding how um, a COP venue is picked, uh, but... Uh, with Modi placing his bid, there are chances that, of course, that um, this is a pro this is definitely going to go down in uh, that direction, um, and who knows uh, whether that could be um, in India in uh, 2028. But at the same time, um, a lot of uh, Prime Minister Modi's emphasis in his speeches was on a new target on climate finance. Um, so we think COP29 is especially going to be one where um, India plays a massive role. A lot of India's GST submissions, submissions to the global stock take were on what this post 2025 goal should be. Um, and also in the global stock take calling attention and submissions to um, failures of developed countries to meet their pre-2020 goals and uh, calling for an assessment of the 100 billion goal in the stock take. Um, but throughout the rest of the COP, India was relatively uh, on the outside, quite silent, um, and chose to play its cards 
uh, quite close to its chest. Um, we see that in, of course, in the preceding amount of language. Now, we know that at Glasgow, um, that the language of phase down was first incorporated uh, around coal. But we're looking at the fossil fuels phase out language, which we've seen in the global stock take. Um, this has now gone from one of the iterations talking about rapidly phasing down to now to accelerating efforts to phase down uh, coal power. And there was also an option which is on limitations on new coal power, which has also been removed from the text um, before COP28, India's coal ministry and uh, power ministry had spoken about increasing new coal capacity while we had France and the US talking about ending private finance for coal. So these were these are th things to pay note. Um, but at the same time, there was a lot of accommodation of other fossil fuels. So uh, for India's climate minister may have walked away sort of pleased. But um, at the same time, India was also really present um, along with basic countries, along with China, in terms of putting forward an agenda item on talking about unilateral trade measures. So with CBAM, um, with the EU's carbon border tax, kind of entering into a transitional phase with the IRA, basic countries had uh, put forward a proposal for unilateral trade measures and their impacts on an equitable and just transition and sustainable development and poverty. They had suggested this as an agenda item, which was included in the provisional agenda, but uh, eventually dropped. Now, this also spilled over to, to uh, discussions in the global stock take, as well as in a section around response measures. And it signals that at this particular point of time, developing countries are looking to have climate-related trade measures being discussed at COPs and not being swept under the carpet. On the other hand, we've seen uh, going by the response measures, the, the tracks as well as the stock take, it looks like de developed countries are keen that these are issues that stay at the World Trade Organization, um, which has other certain rules. But at COP, you know, the, the idea of, and I'm sure Simon is going to get to it, is of course there are, uh, there are more developing countries than developed countries that are putting forward uh, the sorts of uh, proposals as well as measures, whether it's the IRA or whether it's uh, CBAM. And I think uh, this received a lot of heated discussion, but towards the end, I think the word unilateral trade restrictions is only like from a reference to the UN convention itself. Um, and in terms of this being included in response measures, there are no references to cross-border impacts. So which goes to show that there needs to be a sort of, um, and many observers had said that there needs to be a forum where countries can discuss climate, trade, and environment on a platform, even though that exists to a degree in response measures, but um, where developing countries can have greater, stay, greater say um, on the subject. So um, yeah, this, it's going to be uh, more heated, and we have been seeing these uh, discussions stepping up with the WTO. Um, so will COP be able to provide the sort of uh, platform for these discussions uh oh, we'll look for look forward to seeing that thank you um aruna um just to try and quickly complete complete the circle um i'm going to come on to juliana in a second um to talk about obviously juliana you were as our sort of uh, section editor tracking food land and nature that was a a, 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 a big and a very interesting sort of thematic or range of thematics within the COP but just before we do that I just want to go to Orla just to give us a sense of how civil society protests the dynamic of having this COP in UAE um, and some of the the issues around greenwashing and things you know these always bubble up and are a huge issue and I think they're getting bigger and bigger but can you just give a sense I know you were tracking that Orla can you just give us a sense um, of how that played out at the COP? Yeah, thanks, Leo. Um, so I'm Orla, I'm on the Food, Land and Nature team as well. But one of the issues I was covering at COP28 was protests, like Leo said. So pro the discussion around protests and civil society involvement overall at this year's COP was pretty similar to last year in Egypt in terms of the restrictions that civil society felt were being imposed on them and also the countries that the COPs were taking place in. And the UAE in particular protests are banned. And so there was a lot of issues both before the COP and also during the COP for members of civil society in order to get past and so that they could protest during the COP, which has historically always been a huge part of these summits, um, particularly two years ago in Glasgow for COP26. There was one day where 100,000 people took to the streets for one protest. Um, that hasn't been the case for the past two years, although protests are still taking place. 
um, both this year and last year in Egypt, protests pretty much exclusively took place within the blue zone of the conference uh, where UN rules apply. So that's their way of bypassing protest laws in the individual countries that the cops are taking place in. Um, so the civil society people and activists that I spoke to while in Dubai were saying that they felt there were a lot of restrictions put on them, even within these protests in the blue zone. Um, there were certain restrictions, they say, on what they could say at these protests, the things they could wear, the flags they were allowed to wave and not being able to wave many flags. Although I think it is important to note that there are these rules in place at every cop for um, protests that take place, especially within the blue zone. Um, so there were definitely a lot of restrictions for activists and civil society people at this year's COP. Uh, but even still, there were protests taking place every day within the conference area. You could rarely walk outside one of the buildings without seeing another protest going on. Um, the biggest day was on the 9th of December. So there was a few hundred people that took part in a protest, uh, largely calling for climate justice, but also calling for a ceasefire in Palestine. And that was a repeated theme that we saw in a lot of the different protests that took place over the two weeks. Um, then there are other days where there were smaller gatherings from indigenous groups, young people as well. And you'd see a good mix of things Two people dressed up as Pikachus and dugongs and all sorts of things that were going out. So it was definitely still present this year, although a couple of people that I spoke to said that it was much more restrictive than Egypt and the most restrictive cop from their perspective, from civil society that they'd ever been to. So definitely something to keep an eye on, particularly ahead of Azerbaijan this year and next year, sorry. I was asking a couple of people about that because there have been reports about how dissidents are treated in Azerbaijan. So I think that's definitely gonna to continue to be an issue into next year as well. And just quickly on lobbying then and kind of greenwashing was another thing I was looking at, particularly around agriculture. And this is something that a lot of outlets were looking into and just to mention one particular piece and one statistic, uh, there was a piece in Smog and The Guardian, and they found that there were three times as many meat and dairy delegates from the industry at this year's COP compared to last year in Sharm El Sheikh. So they were definitely out in strong force this year. And there was a lot of reports of greenwashing taking place in, in Dubai this year. Brilliant. Thank you, Orla. Um, and then finally, Juliana, obviously we... Um, at Carbon Brief, we track um, sort of the, the thematics around deforestation, food, biodiversity very closely. Um, how did you see those issues playing out at this year's COP? There was a food systems kind of pavilion and, you know, it feels like it's sort of ramping up a, as an issue, although deforestation may have been a, a marginally lower kind of key issue compared to some recent COPs. Can you just give us a sense, Juliana, of, of how those thematics kind of landed in from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Leah. Um, so food in particular has uh, long been sort of the forgotten uh, or maybe ignored child of, um, of the climate negotiations. So uh, people within the food world will be quick to point out that food systems are responsible for about one third of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so food systems are seen as both a source of climate change, but also a solution. Um, and, uh, and unlike sort of fuels where we can find sort of different energy sources and different ways of powering things we need to power, we can't just stop producing food. Um, so it has been, attention on food has been ramping up, um, I'd say since COP26 in Glasgow. And it was um, pretty prominent at COP this year in a number of ways. So the first sort of big declaration of the World Climate Action Summit, which was the, the gathering of the leaders, was the Emirates Declaration on Sustainable Agriculture Food Systems Transformation and Climate Change, I think, don't quote me on that. Um, and so that declaration was essentially a, a recognition of the sort of outsized impacts that climate change has on the agricultural sector um, and a commitment from the countries who signed it to do several things. Um, the most, the sort of headline of which was to begin to, and by, uh, by COP30 in Brazil in two years time, 
to integrate food into their national climate plans, national biodiversity plans, uh, and other sort of uh, national plans. Um, so this de declaration had 134 countries sign on to it um, at the beginning of COP, and by as of yesterday, it was 158. Um, and that's really significant. That's, I believe, the most sort of the signatories that a leader's pledge has gotten, surpassing the, um, the Glasgow Declaration on Forests. And it covers about 80% of the world's um, food systems emissions, so including major players like China, the US, Brazil, the EU. Um, and so a lot of civil society organizations looked at that pledge and thought that it didn't go far enough because it didn't mention the links between food systems and fossil fuels, which are major. Um, but several other experts sort of rightly pointed out that if you're going to get 100 and almost 60 countries to sign on to a pledge, it's going to have to be pretty uh, palatable to a wide range of people. And so accompanying the Food Systems Pledge was the uh, Alliance of Champions for Food Systems Transformation. And so that's a group of five countries that has committed to sort of pushing forward on this. And um, as one person told me, they're raising the ceiling on the ambition of food systems transformation, whereas the declaration was raising the floor. Um, the uh, food was also mentioned in the both the global stock take and the global goal on adaptation. And that marks the first time that food has been mentioned in sort of a major uh, negotiated text under the UNFCCC. Um, the need to halt and reverse deforestation by 2030 was also, uh, this was a pledge made previously, but this was also included in the negotiated text. Okay, thanks, Juliana. Um, yeah, let's let's dive into some of the um, the questions from the audience. Um, there's one that we've actually had emailed in in advance, which I think is it's quite an interesting one because it gets to some of, and I've seen that this issue coming up in some of the Q and A box on on the right hand side on the Zoom call. But there's one that um, Alan Tilly emailed in from the University of North Florida, which is, what are the chances of altering the voting procedure at COPS to diminish the power of fossil fuel interests? And we've had another similar question from Jared Abrahams in, in Tel Aviv, says, to what extent is a consensus decision-making process an issue and how could it be changed? And I've seen in the, in the Q&A, people are asking around the issue of, is any of this binding? You know, is this all voluntary? Um, Simon, I know you looked into this particular issue a bit at this COP um, around, you know, just not just the broad framework of what the Paris Agreement is, this kind of, you know, the peer pressure sort of dynamic of the Paris Agreement, but what could could rules be changed? How would they be changed? Do we have to have this consensus making or could you have majority voting by countries, etc? You know, how, what, what is what is at play there? Yeah, th thanks, Leo. Just to say very briefly as well, I've been trying to answer as many questions as I can um, while other people have been speaking, but there's, I mean, there's more than a thousand of you here and many, many questions, so we're probably not going to get to all of them. Uh, specifically on the rules, of, <clears throat> excuse me, on the rules of procedure. So, I mean, as we as we said in, in our summary of, of this COP, this goes all the way back to COP1 in, in 1995, which where the, the president of, of that COP was Angela Merkel, um, and they they basically introduced some rules of procedure on how to run the cops into the future. And one of the rules in you know draft rules is about voting. And that said, basically every country or every party was going to get a vote um, if they couldn't reach consensus on a particular matter. And then there were various different ways that they they were talking about having holding those votes, whether it was going to be a two thirds majority, three quarters majority, or whatever, and whether they would have carve outs for particular kinds of decisions like financial decisions. And um, basically what, what we what we report found was that um, the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, anyone that, that follows the COP closely hopefully already knows about them. Um, they reported back at COP1 that, that it was OPEC, um, the oil producers cartel, which at the time was operating as a negotiating group in the COP that, that ultimately blocked um, the adoption of, of voting rules 
and um perhaps even more interestingly um i, I was told by joanna to, to pledge a researcher at cambridge university that that in fact um us fossil fuel lobbyists were working very closely with opec at the time to basically try and engineer this blocking of, of voting rules um so i mean that that's the backstory which is fascinating in its own right obviously the question is could that be changed I mean, the point is, in order to agree voting rules, they'd have to agree it by consensus. So I think it's a little bit of a catch twenty two situation. Um, you know, we're on to COP twenty eight now, and they haven't they haven't ever adopted those rules rules of procedure in full because of that dispute over voting. So it's quite hard to see how they get past that, to be honest. Okay, thank thanks, Simon. Um, just looking through some of these other questions, there's a, there's one here which I think it would be interesting to get Daisy's view on, which is Tom Jennings is asking, did the panel notice any positive difference in having a business leader as a COP president versus a politician? I think I can't remember. I don't think I can remember a dynamic where it isn't a politician. It's typically the, the environment minister or whoever who is the COP president. Um, and it relates in a way to the question from Mike Landy around do petro states condemn all future cops to achieve no more than incremental progress? Daisy, in your view, what what was this cop like having effectively an oil, you know, oil, oil company chief, you know, in, in charge? Did that make it a very different cop? And do you think that it well, I think many people have a view on this, a very sharp view. Did that change the outcome in any way? Um in terms of his own personal dynamic? Thanks, yeah, thanks for the question, Tom, and others. Um, I think you could definitely tell that uh, Al Jabir was a businessman. He had some kind of like strict language that he kept to. He kept saying 1.5 is my North Star. He kept saying um, this cop will be like no other. This cop will leave no issue off the table. So you could tell he was very well versed in sticking to lines and breathing people. Um, in like I mentioned before, he did score some early wins. He did like get the agenda agreed. He got loss and damage fund operationalized on the first day. Um, when negotiations were sort of falling into disarray, I think Earth Negotiations Bulletin described it as in the second week, he held something called a majlis, which is an Arabic word for an Emirati tradition where you get a big group of people around a table to try and find a solutions uh, orientated way forward. Um, and Al Jabir said at the end of COP that the majlis made all the difference in achieving the outcome. So I think just those examples there give a, a, give a sense of how, you know, him being a businessman shaped how he was the president of the COP in terms of I guess some some quite big and more difficult questions about whether the outcome would have been different if we didn't have an oil executive at the head of this talks. So I think it's really difficult to answer that question. Um, one thing I will say is at COP27 in Egypt, uh, which I went to and followed, there was uh, reports that Egypt actually blocked mentions of fossil fuels from being in negotiated texts and Al Jabir didn't do that. Um, so, you know, that might give you some kind of sense of did it really make that much difference I don't know I mean obviously there's very legitimate questions about his conflict of interest and you know the Guardian's reporting today that he's said that he's still going to invest in oil through ADNOC which obviously raises again just serious conflicts uh conflict of interest questions um but yeah it's, it's a tricky one to answer but I hope that helps okay thanks Daisy yeah uh, handed you a tricky one there um on the issue of of finance, um, as we said before, when Josh was speaking, it's it's pretty hard to go to any COP where finance isn't a dominant issue. But there's there's a couple of interesting questions. One from Nicholas um, Hanrahan, which Josh you can maybe take on, which is this issue of like pledged money. Is it actually new money or is it old <laughs> money? You know, are they you know is it double counting, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And there's another question from Melanie Larkin, which is. What is the US rationale for its low dollar commitment to the loss and damage fund relative to rich peers? Um, and that definitely stood out. I think we've mentioned that already, but that what the US put into the fund was kind of noticeable by how small it was in comparison to their size and their wealth, et cetera. Just, you, you know, Josh, if you can just quickly address that issue of kind of, is it new money, old money, you know, pre-announced, et cetera? Um, yeah, so climate finance is incredibly, it's a complete mess, essentially, I think it's fair to say. And I think countries kind of can um, 
take advantage of the the kind of vagaries of it um, at these kind of summits by coming up with these big pledges. And to be honest, who's to say whether they are new or old? In each case, it's going to be it's going to be a completely different situation with each one. So certainly with the loss and damage pledges, it has been reported. In some cases, it's been acknowledged by uh, governments of, um, for example, uh, I think the UK and Canada both uh, noted this and Ireland as well. Um, that the the funding they're announcing isn't new in the sense that they have already announced it. The the UK has an eleven point six billion uh, climate finance pledge in place, um, and this money is going uh, for the loss and damage fund is going to come from that. So it's not new in that sense, um, but just more generally, I mean, climate finance. What people call climate finance is you know varies from country to country and. There's no definition of climate finance within the UN system. So um, so I, I think for certainly as journalists, it makes uh, our job difficult because you kind of have to scrutinise each of the pledges independently. Um, and definitely any big pledges. And for example, the UAE um, talked about how this, this summit had mobilised, I think, mobilised 80 billion in, in dollars in climate finance statements like that need to be taken with like an enormous fistful of salt because you know that it, it's just you know who's to say there'll be all kinds of different kinds of money in there um some of it will have already been announced some of it maybe forthcoming in 10 years time some of it will you know it's 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 all over the, over the place i hope that kind of answers the question and I, it's kind of just to communicate how yeah how complicated the, the, these kind of things can be. I can't with the second question about um, the US, uh, the US is relatively small pledge. Yeah, so for, for the loss and damage fund, I mean, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. I def, it's, it, it's interesting to note that the US's pledge was particularly small, $17.5 million uh, from the world's biggest economy, um, smaller than Ireland's contribution is smaller than Spain's. Um, yes, there's there's a kind of thing, lots of things going on here. First of all, they've got to approve that money with Congress, which is uh, uh, so they have to get it past uh, Republicans, um, which is not easy because they don't like giving a climate finance internationally as a, as a rule. Um, the US generally has been quite opposed historically to the idea of loss and damage at all um as a concept because they don't want to be held uh, responsible for their historic emissions um i think just broadly speaking part you know in, in large part because of uh, the difficulty in getting climate finance past republicans um the us has massively underperformed as a climate finance contributor when you consider you know how wealthy it is as as a nation um yeah I think, yeah, that's fair to say. OK, thanks, Josh. Um, there's a question here which maybe um, Annika can take on because it, it definitely is an issue that a lot of people are thinking about coming out of this COP, which is going back to that, that sort of what you described, Annika, as the, the G2 relationship um, between the US um, and China. I think you you wrote in your section, Annika, about how China took to approach this COP, um, and also in your China briefing newsletter that we sent out um, yesterday, um, that John Kerry, the U.S. climate envoy, is eighty, just turned eighty, I think, um, and his and the Chinese climate envoy, um, Xi Jinping, is is also mid seventies, and I think he's already announced that he's that was his last COP. That dynamic, particularly in the run-up to the Paris Agreement in 2015, between those countries, those individuals, has been seen as crucial. Are there concerns that this kind of sort of this double act are kind of going to go their separate ways now? Um, what's your sense of that, Annika? Thanks, Leo. I think that it's it's absolutely an open question what what um, the relationship is going to look like. As you said, Xia Jinping's going to retire very soon. He, he hasn't um, made that a secret at all. We It hasn't been officially announced, but it seems pretty set that his replacement is going to be a guy called Liu Junmin, who is currently an uh, Under Secretary General. I always, I always get the exact hyphenations confused. 
um, but within the UN, he's he's quite high up within China's delegation in the UN. So he already has quite strong international experience, connections. Um, but I think the concern is, as a guy who's part of the Chinese foreign ministry, as opposed to the environment ministry, does he have the networks within within these kind of COP circles, right, to, to keep pushing on that positive momentum? Um, we'll need to wait and see is, is the honest answer. But what I would say from COP is that a lot of time has been put into centering Liu as, as the kind of heir apparent to Xi. He's been in hour-long meetings with Kerry and with the US team. Um, I had a fun moment where I was chasing a golf buggy where he and Sue Biniaz, who's who's um, Kerry's deputy on the US side, were, were kind of having a deep conversation on their way to the methane summit. Um, I was at an event where he uh, he shared a stage with Jennifer Morgan, the German climate envoy, who also said that they'd been having very in-depth conversations about um, comparing the kind of Chinese and German models of transitioning to net zero. So I think that I think that it's it's definitely going to be interesting seeing the switch from from one ministry kind of leading to another. But Leo has been building up those networks. So we'll just have to see. But I, I think there's definitely cause for optimism. OK, thanks, Annika. Um, we've I don't think we've really talked about Article 6 yet um, and sort of carbon markets, etc. There's been a couple of questions around this. There's um, yacht wetterings. I, I hope I pronounced that right. Could you tell us more about the politics behind the Article 6 negotiations falling apart? There's also a question from Wilfried Mass. Can you comment on the Article 6 breakdown and how the voluntary carbon market will be impacted? Um, I, I, who should we take that? Aruna, maybe, and Simon? I don't know. Aruna, do you want to have a quick um, go at that? And maybe Simon can come in. No? Okay, we're <laughs> really shaking our head. Okay, Simon, do you want to have a, a go at that? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Article 6 is always, it's always one of the most kind of deeply technical parts of the talks. And... Um, so, but yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, I think there was, there were hopes ahead of, of this COP that, you know, having agreed the rules in COP26 um, in Glasgow, that, that, you know, that they would be able to just kind of get on with starting things operating under uh, under Article 6, but it turned out to be unexpectedly um, kind of uh, fractured, I guess. So, I mean, taking them in turn, Article 6.2 is about two countries trading carbon between between themselves. And that was always supposed to be a little bit more kind of loose, like, it, you know, kind of up to the, the countries, the, the pair of countries to decide how to do it. But there was a big, big dispute um, in Dubai about whether to kind of impose some sort of order on that um, in terms of the process and in terms of like checking consistencies, looking at confidential information and so on. And, you know, what we heard was that the US was one of the countries really pushing for there to be limited rules um, and then the EU and Latin American countries and others really wanting to try and have have some sort of process and control. Um, and there were, you know, there were quite big arguments about whether those 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 pushing for more control were kind of going beyond the mandate that had been agreed earlier. Um, so that that seems like it's quite a big divide. It's quite hard to see how they're going to bridge that. Um, and then that sort of, you know, I think the two the two are often kind of linked together. So people were saying, well, if we can't have a decision on one, then we won't have it on either. But then on, on Article 6.4, which is about setting up a new international carbon market, um, that, you know, this is meant to be kind of driving integrity, you know, high standards and so on, um, that could potentially kind of lead to, to, you know, that spilling in, you know, sort of a spillover effect into the voluntary markets. Um, you know, I think that you know they have made progress compared to last year, but but the key sticking point seems to be around the guidance on removals. So this is stuff like you know you know land based removals, trees, or, or or potentially engineered removals. And I mean, what I what I was told by one negotiator was just that the, the guidance on removals were were quite sort of poorly drafted in their view, and that quite a lot of the paragraphs could be read and interpreted in different ways. And if you, you know that's not a great starting point, so I think you know quite a lot of, of parties just weren't happy with those with those uh, that guidance. Um, so ultimately, we're just going to have to come back next year. And obviously, that just means the market can't start um, for at least another year. Um, so that's left a lot of people disappointed. But you know, then on the other hand, some people said no deal was better than a bad deal. <laughs> 
Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, we're pretty rapidly coming to an end in terms of time. We've probably got to quickly probably squeeze one or two in. There's a question maybe Juliana can take to take on, which is from Jack um, Kunkel, which is how important are the side deals at COPs? You know, we hear about the, the formal COP process and the negotiations, but there's often bi bilaterals. There's, you know, there's often sort of deals between a small cluster of countries. Is there anything that caught your eye, um, Juliana, around, around some of these um, side deals? You know, the, I think you've mentioned things like, you know, the forest pledges, you know, um, um, and obviously bigger things like the food. Is there anything, just how did that, from your sense, play out in terms of the sort of the dynamic of COP28? Yeah, I guess I can speak maybe to the, the sort of flurry of declarations, um, which is a feature of at least every COP that I've attended, um, where, especially towards the beginning, um, of the summit, the leaders will come in and sort of throw around these big declarations. So there was the, the food declaration, but there was also one the next day on climate and health that garnered um, more than 100 signatories to begin with. And so the thing about sort of all of these pledges is that they're non-binding, right? So they are not as important as the, uh, the formal negotiations, and they like never will be is uh, how how one person I spoke to referred to it, but they do send a, a strong political signal um, that something is important. And so people in the, the food world and the health world in particular were quite pleased that at least food and health are being talked about in the context of climate change because historically they have not uh, sort of been included under the UNFCCC. Okay, thanks, Juliana. I think we probably have got one type, you know, it's a big, big question, but I might just hand over to Simon for this one. There's a question just coming at the end, David Bent Hazelwood. What likelihood would you give to staying under two degrees C of warming and how much difference did COP28 make to the probability from your point of view? Oof, that's that's a big question. Uh... I mean, you know, you know, we quoted um, Carvey Gillenpool from um, C2ES in, in the piece saying that, you know, the moment of truth comes when countries submit their new climate pledges um, by 2025. So, I mean, I guess the sort of the easy sort of, but probably correct answer is we have to wait and see. I mean, I think, you know, the latest assessments suggest if countries just meet their their, their current climate pledges to 2030, then we're looking at, you know, something like two and a half, 2.8 degrees. But if countries implement in full all of their net zero pledges, which arguably is is not looking super likely right now, um, then, you know, there's a potential to go below two degrees. And, you know, in fact, the stock take acknowledges that. Um, but yeah, as to whether as to whether COP28 makes a difference, I mean, I think it, yeah, it, it all depends how countries respond you know, the COP can make decisions, you know, um, it can say all it likes in terms of uh, this legal text, but only, you know, countries are the ones that can deliver action. Okay, thanks, Simon. And thanks um, to all my colleagues, um, well, firstly, for their huge efforts over the last two weeks, um, to both at the COP itself, but also trying to get our summary articles out. So, you know, please go and look at our website, um, sign up to our newsletters, etc. I know many of you already do, but um, yeah, pretty much most of the key questions answered will be somewhere within those articles. Um, but as I said, there's been some great questions. I know Simon and others have tried to answer a lot of them kind of live. We'll 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 take a snapshot of all of them and see if we can continue addressing some of them where we can, and then we'll post a recording of of this of this session. Um, on our website early next week but just to say yeah thanks for everyone for joining it's been fun uh, maybe we should do this again next year um have a great break everyone and um thanks for joining okay goodbye